Welcome to Bible class at the Greenberry Church of Christ. I really do appreciate your presence as we begin a new Bible study uh, today. We're going to be reading the Gospel of Luke, the good news of Jesus. And uh, what excites me about uh, this study is that not only will we read major portions of Luke together, but we will go right into the book of Acts following our uh, time. Luke which will be over the next three months. Gospel of Luke, the good news of Jesus. Let's pray before we go further. Our Father in heaven, as this Lord's day begins, we begin in praise of you. For truly, this is the Lord's day. It is yours, and we are yours. Father, we cannot begin this day without giving you thanks for your provision of our needs, and certainly not only our needs physically, but our needs spiritually. For indeed, as the Lord said, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to be a part, to spend some time together in your word today to be a part of this study. O Lord, we're grateful also for the gift of love that you have given us through your Son. Certainly, this will be in the background of our minds as we read the Gospel of Luke together. Our Father, we also begin this day with a confession of our sins and of our need for forgiveness. Our Father, we know that You are sovereign and that You are generous and You are gracious in Your salvation and righteous in all of Your judgments. Our Father in heaven, we praise You this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Luke, the author of two volumes, two great volumes, a gospel, and uh, then a book of history, the Acts of the Apostles, as it is known traditionally and uh, is so labeled in all of our Bibles. Two books of the New Testament which address uh, a single individual is my opinion, uh, here they are addressed to Theophilus. And, uh, of course, that word means friend of God. Uh, so, in a general sense, maybe all friends of God, but I, it seems to me I think not. Um, it's interesting then that 27.5% of the New Testament, as we have it, is written initially to a single individual. And this amount of the New Testament is the largest single contribution by any author, and it provides the framework really for uh, what you see here. Uh, the church's calendar begins initially, I, I guess, at uh, the first day of Advent, which I believe would always be the first Sunday in, uh, in December, though we're not folk who who give a lot of attention to the Christian calendar, but the Christian calendar is initiated by the first couple of chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And so uh, Luke really forms uh, the historical framework for the entire New Testament, uh, except, I would say, for the book of Revelation. But Luke starts with these birth stories of Jesus, and then he concludes in the book of Acts with Paul's imprisonment in Rome. And essentially, that's the, the history of... Uh, that's the Christian history of the first century as we know it that's sketched out in the Gospel of Luke. Now, there's some things beyond that which uh, would be uh, Revelation uh, because traditionally we believe Revelation was written, let's say, in about 90, or 90 to 100 A.D., uh, so that falls outside of the historical framework that you have in the Gospel of Luke. Nevertheless, uh, Luke really does uh, frame the whole story for us. Luke traveled with Paul. That's how we know about Luke. We read of in Acts 16, in those chapters that you see on, on the slide are, are chapters in the book of Acts where you're going to find the first person uh, yes, first person plural pronoun we. Uh, so, for example, in Acts 16, that first chapter, 
We read of Paul, Silas, and Timothy coming to Troas on Paul's second missionary journey. Acts 16, 6 through 8 tells of Paul's desire to go preach the word to a- in Asia, uh, which would have been essentially uh, the, the province uh, whose capital was Ephesus, so in that region of the world. But he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. And then they attempted to go to Bithynia, and that would have been in a northerly direction from this point of of the history in Acts 16 where Paul, Silas, and Timothy were located, but they were prevented by the Spirit of Jesus to go uh, into Bithynia. And so the only direction couldn't go west, couldn't go north, and so they go northwest. And they go to a city named Troas. They passed by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And what's critical here is they went down to Troas, third person plural. But in verse 9, we are told that a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Thus the agenda for the continuation of the journey is set by the Lord. And then in verse 10, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia. And so the author of the Acts, who... uh, and we'll, we'll see some things how this corresponds to Luke. But the author of the Acts thus joins the, the group. So what we kind of put together is the fact that Dr. Luke had a practice. Dr. Luke, who was a Christian, had a practice in Troas. Or maybe Paul converted him, although there's pretty good evidence that they didn't stay in Troas long enough. Nevertheless, Luke joins that group and they go to Philippi. And then, what we also know is that when Paul, Silas, and Timothy left uh, Philippi to go to Thessalonica, Luke stays in, in Philippi, and then he's going to show up next back in Troas. Well, that's a lot of detail more about the book of Acts. Let's get on to, to uh, Luke, the Gospel, but first... Luke, the beloved physician. So here we go. Paul, as he wrote Colossians, and we believe that he wrote Colossians from his Roman imprisonment, which would have been at the conclusion or the time period at the conclusion of the book of Acts, that while he's there in prison, Luke, the beloved physician, is with him and sends greetings uh, back to the or to the church in Colossae, and then. This final uh, indication of Luke's presence with Paul, in my belief, and I think a a lot of of scholars would conclude that what you have in 2 Timothy 4 is a second uh, imprisonment of Paul in Rome. So that Paul was initially uh, imprisoned in Rome, went to trial, trial, was not found guilty, had some time outside prison, and now in the final because the tone of, of Colossians and Philippians, uh, those are, are, they have a tone that, in which Paul expects to be released. And so we assume that he, he was. But then 2 Timothy is much different. Uh, Paul, uh, the tone of 2 Timothy is such that Paul expects to be executed. He knows that the end has come. And when he says that, and writes to Timothy, asking Timothy to come to him, and some other things, of course. But the conclusion of the letter, please come. And he says, Luke alone is with me. And so what you have is the uh, just these little pieces fit together into a uh, really a beautiful tapestry of, uh, of a Gentile convert who was trained as a physician or a physician who became a Christian, a Gentile Christian in that world, and he had a great relationship with one of the most influential persons in all of Christian history, and that is the Apostle Paul. Well, why read the Gospel of Luke? I'm going to give my answer, and then we're going to look at another answer as well. And the the second is more important than the first. But first of all, reading Luke Acts, you get the whole scope of God's plan. And, and it is a gospel that probes some important questions. Uh, like, uh, 
How did an originally Jewish movement become the basis of salvation for all? Now, I, I would really rewrite that question. I would rewrite it more in terms of what you hear in the second question. How do we go from Bethlehem, Nazareth to Rome? That's quite a move and quite a journey. And that's what we have in Luke's writings. We go all the way from Bethlehem all the way from Bethlehem all the way to Rome. And from a Jewish movement that became a Jewish Gentile movement or a movement that was for the whole world. And that's going to be an important theme that you'll be able to follow as you read Luke and as you continue to read Acts. Uh, That's a huge transition uh, to go from simply a Jewish sect is what they believed, and many outsiders believe that's how you would classify Christianity. But we noted, we know historically uh, that the transition is much, much greater than that. And how could a crucified Messiah become the hope for all humanity? These questions and more are important questions that are asked by the Apostle. Uh, I'm sorry, that are asked by Luke in his writings. Now, we're going to go to one of my favorite resources, Bible Project. These guys produce a great little map of anything in all the Bible. Let's give attention to Luke part 1 from the Bible Project. The Gospel according to Luke. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and it's actually part one of a unified two-volume work, Luke Acts. If you compare the opening lines of both of these books, it's clear that they come from the same author. And there are internal clues in the book of Acts, as well as an early tradition that identifies the author as Luke, the traveling companion and co-worker of Paul the Apostle, who we know was also a doctor. Luke opens his work with a preface telling us how and why he wrote this book. He acknowledges that there's many other fine accounts of Jesus' life out there, but he wanted to go back to the eyewitness traditions of as many early disciples as he could in order to produce what he calls an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now that word fulfilled shows us why Luke wrote this account. For him, the story of Jesus isn't just ancient history. He wants to show how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant story of God and Israel, and bigger than that, of the story of God in the whole world. The book's design is fairly clear. There's a long introduction that sets up the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. Then in chapters 3 to 9, Luke presents a robust portrait of Jesus and his mission in his home region of Galilee. After that, the large midsection of the book is Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem, which leads to the story's climax, Jesus' final week in Jerusalem leading up to his death and resurrection, which then leads on into the book of Acts. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half of Luke's gospel. The extended introduction tells in parallel the birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. So you have this elderly priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then this young unmarried woman, Mary and Joseph. They both receive an unlikely divine promise that they're going to have a son. Both promises are fulfilled then, as John and then Jesus are born, and both parents sing poems of celebration. Now these poetic songs, they're filled with echoes from the Old Testament psalms and prophets, showing how these children will fulfill God's ancient promises. But these poems also preview each child's role in the story to follow. So John is the prophetic messenger promised in the Torah and the prophets who's going to prepare Israel to meet their God. And Jesus, he's the messianic king promised to David, who's going to bring God's reign over Israel and God's blessing to the nations, just like he promised to Abraham. After this, Mary brings Jesus to the Jerusalem temple for his dedication, and two elderly prophets, Anna and Simeon, they see Jesus and they recognize who he is. And Simeon sings his own song, a poem inspired by the prophet Isaiah. He says, this child is God's salvation for Israel, and he will become a light to the nations. 
So with all this anticipation, the story moves forward into the next main section, where Luke presents Jesus and his mission. He sets the stage with John's renewal movement at the Jordan River, where he's calling a new, repentant, recommitted Israel into existence through baptism. He's preparing for the arrival of God's kingdom. And then Jesus appears as the leader of this new Israel, and he's marked out by the Spirit and the voice of God from heaven. He is the beloved Son of God. After this, Luke follows with the genealogy, and it traces Jesus' origins back to David, then back to Abraham, and then all the way back to Adam from the book of Genesis. Luke's claiming here that Jesus is the messianic king of Israel who will bring God's blessing, but not only to Israel, the family of Abraham. He is here for all the sons of Adam, for all humanity. After this, Luke has strategically placed the story of Jesus going to his hometown, Nazareth, where he launches his public mission. At a synagogue gathering, Jesus stands up and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners, new sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. Now, along with the other Gospels, Jesus is presented here. He's the Messianic King bringing the good news of God's kingdom. But what Luke uniquely highlights are the social implications of Jesus' mission. So he brings freedom. The Greek word is aphasis. It literally means release, and it refers to the ancient Jewish practice of the year of Jubilee described in Leviticus 25. It's when all Israelite slaves were released, when people's debts were canceled, when land that was sold is returned back to families. It's all a symbolic reenactment of God's liberating justice and mercy. And then Jesus says that this good news of release is specifically for the poor. Now, in the Old Testament, the poor, or in Hebrew, ani, it's a much broader category than just people who don't have very much money. It refers also to people of low social status in their culture, like people with disabilities or women and children and the elderly. It also can include social outsiders, like people of other ethnic groups, or people whose poor life choices have placed them outside acceptable religious circles. And Jesus says that God's kingdom is especially good news for these people. So after this, Luke immediately puts in front of us a large block of stories, showing us what Jesus' good news for the poor looks like. It involves the healing of a bedridden sick woman, or a man who has a skin disease, or someone who's paralyzed. There are stories here also about Jesus welcoming into his community a tax collector, like Levi, who's not financially poor, but he is a social outsider. There's a story about Jesus forgiving a prostitute. Luke showing us how Jesus' kingdom brought restoration and reversal of people's whole life circumstances. He's expanding the circle of people who get invited in to discover the healing power of God's kingdom. And as Jesus' mission attracts a large following, he does something even more provocative. He forms these people into a new Israel by appointing over them the 12 disciples as leaders corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jesus teaches his manifesto of an upside-down kingdom, or as Luke calls it, the sermon given on the plain. He says God's love for the outsider and the poor means that his kingdom brings a reversal of all of our value systems. He is here to form a new alternative people of God who are going to respond to Jesus' invitation by practicing radical generosity, by serving the poor. People who are going to lead by serving and live by peacemaking and forgiveness. People who are deeply pious but who reject religious hypocrisy. Now, Jesus' radical kingdom vision, his claim to divine authority, it starts to generate resistance and controversy, especially from Israel's religious leaders. His outreach to questionable people, it's a threat to their religious traditions and their sense of social stability. And so they start accusing Jesus of blaspheming God, of being a drunk and mixing with sinners. And so this section culminates in a new revelation of Jesus' mission to his disciples. He says that Yes, he is the messianic king, and that he's going to assert his reign over Israel by dying in Jerusalem, by becoming the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53, who dies for the sins of Israel. And then the shocking idea, it gets explored in the next story, as Jesus goes up a mountain with three of his disciples, and he's suddenly transformed in front of them. They're enveloped in this cloud of God's presence, who announces, this is my chosen son. 
And then Moses and Elijah are there, the two other prophets who encountered God's presence and voice on a mountain. And Luke tells us that they're talking together about Jesus' exodus that he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now that Greek word exodus, it's a clear reference to the exodus story. Luke is portraying Jesus here as a new Moses who will lead his newly formed Israel into freedom and release from the tyranny of sin and evil in all of its forms, personal, spiritual, and social. And that's going to lead us into the second half of the book. But for now, that's the first half of the gospel according to Luke. If you want that resource, you can go to BibleProject.com. Uh, you can actually download and print the, uh, the map that they produce. Uh, uh, and, uh, there, there are several ways to outline Luke and say uh, probably a, a good way to... Because what, what is there is great, and what is there roughly fits the four parts that I am suggesting you can remember for the Gospel of Luke. But chapters 1 and 2, the infancy material, then the preparation material goes from chapter 3 uh, to uh, 9a, let's say, uh, would be one of the ways to look at that. And then you could look at the remainder of, of the Galilean ministry which takes you all the way to 19, uh, chapter 9, verse 50. So you, uh, one thing that's interesting about Luke is that 951 is uh, the hinge point, so to speak, because uh, when you get to 951, Jesus then turns His attention toward Jerusalem. And over half the Gospel is driven by Jerusalem and what is going to happen there. And we'll note that as we go along the way. Uh, but the other thing that's kind of interesting, which the, uh, the video uh, outline suggested, is how much of the Gospel of Luke uh, speaks of the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, which is kind of interesting because Luke as a Gentile would not have grown up, so to speak, with the Old Testament. But he paid really careful attention to all of that. Uh, and so we need to watch for how what Luke writes uh, is a fulfillment of Old Testament history. Well, the other uh, answer to the question as to why should we read Luke comes from Luke himself. So if you will, and I know part of the screen is dark, and what I did not do and what I want to do is we will read this entire uh text uh, uh, at the beginning of each class, because this is, this is Luke's uh, purpose. This serves as kind of an anchor point or an orientation for reading the Gospel of Luke. So if you will, let's read the whole thing and then I'll come back to verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. That's one long sentence in the original language it serves as the, as the introduction to all that will follow in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew and Mark were likely written about the same time, but here Luke seems to refer to other written accounts of the life of Jesus. Others have undertaken to compile a narrative. And many scholars would believe that that Luke actually had access to the Gospel of Mark and used Mark as source material. But it's also evident that Luke was involved, or Luke took the time to talk to people who were eyewitnesses of the ministry, uh, of the life and ministry of the Lord. It's just my opinion. 
But I think somewhere along the way, because of the detail that we have in Luke 1 and 2, somewhere along the way, Luke had the opportunity to sit down with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and listen to her story. Just some details that appear in the Gospel that indicate that he had really close access to Mary's uh, knowledge of what had happened from the very beginning. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. And so he's saying, what he's saying is, here's my method. I went and, and interviewed, so to speak, the eyewitnesses. I found other written material and I pulled all of those together. I listened to the eyewitnesses. I listened to those who were preaching about Jesus, those ministers of the Word, and how that has been delivered to us. And then Theophilus, that's the next verse. Uh, good friend Theophilus, uh, I've pulled all of this together for you. It is remarkable that all of this was originally and inten uh, intentionally originally written for one person. Think about that. What, uh, what love he had for Theophilus. What, what, and and I, who knows, I would anticipate that Luke had the idea that other people are going to read this. I hope, but but that's, he's not writing to the whole world. He's writing to one individual, Theophilus, one who loves God. But it sounds like to me, not a general term for all believers, but a proper term with a title, most excellent, which indicates a person of some rank or distinction. Why does he write this? That you may know the certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So you wonder, was he already a Christian? Or was he thinking about becoming a Christian? If he's thinking about becoming a Christian, this in a sense is a, um, evangelistic material. This is what I will tell you, that you would become a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. If he's already done that, if he's already been baptized, uh, this is... Uh, Years ago, we had a, a book that we would use, a little teaching series called Now That I'm a Christian. And so maybe, maybe Theophilus has recently been baptized and he needs some Now That I'm a Christian teaching so that he would have assurance or certainty, that you would have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught, which means that, that we are blessed to be able to sit, let's say, sort of beside, a little bit behind Theophilus and, and look over his shoulder and, and read the book with him that we might have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught. Well, N.T. Wright speaks of Luke opening this introduction that we've just read, 1 through 4, as a, as a huge stone entrance to the gospel, welcome you impressively into a large building. And Luke is saying, here's something solid, something you can trust. This is not a fly-by-night or casual account. It will hold its head up to the world at large. And when N.T. Wright mentioned the huge stone entrance, I thought of these Hellenistic gates to Perga. I was blessed to be able to visit uh, this archaeological site of the city of Perga where Paul went through these gates on his first missionary journey. Perga is a city uh, on the southern, uh, not quite on the coast, but almost on the uh, southern coast, uh, uh, central coast of the, what is now the country of Turkey. At that time it was Asia. Asia. And, and Paul walked through these gates. Uh, I walked through those gates with my good friend Calvin Warpula there on the left. Uh, Derek, and I cannot remember Derek's name at the time he was preaching for a church in uh, Mount Pleasant, Texas. He's not there anymore. Uh, uh, I think he moved to Lubbock. Garrett Best uh, 
is now the chairman of the Biblical Studies Department at York University, and there I am uh, enjoying the opportunity to see those impressive gates. And that's kind of a way to say, I think what N.T. Wright says about it's an impressive entrance into the gospel, which says, read the introduction. Uh, I have a tendency to skip the introduction and get to chapter 1. Uh, in this case, the introduction is very, very important. Luke is going to focus on making people who follow Jesus. And he does that, first of all, with his own example. He takes the responsibility to do the kind of research, to write the kind of, of story, gospel that he's going to write. He takes responsibility to do that for one individual. And, and he knows himself the gospel well enough to share it and to share it in a written form and that's a challenge to us as well we need to know the gospel well enough to share it and then we must persist in the mission of making and maturing disciples and from the hints that we have along the way Luke is faithful to following the Lord being in fellowship with other uh, Christians even in difficult times, like being with Paul at Paul's last imprisonment and uh, the writing or the reference that we have in 2 Timothy. Assurance. He wrote that we may know. Uh, the other word, the word in the ESV is certainty. He wants us to be certain. He, he can be confident that Jesus is the promised One of God who brings forgiveness of sins and represents the inauguration of God's plan. He can be sure that the suffering the disciples currently experience in the world, which would be likely, very, very likely, in the time of Theophilus, when he initially read this Gospel, that that was no surprise to God, because all of us are marching in the footsteps of the Savior. And, uh, and so those are the kinds of things, that, that and more, that Luke wants uh, Theophilus to be sure about. Is assurance a matter of knowing or feeling? Well, it's actually both. But the knowing will precede the feeling. We're confident. We are confident followers of Jesus, rooted in historical truth. And that's one of the things that, Paul, uh, that Luke is saying here at the beginning of his Gospel. This happened in time... In space, this happened. Also, I, I, I don't know, uh, have you ever heard of six degrees of separation? Uh, it was uh, actually a, an idea proposed in a short story in 1929. I didn't realize that this idea was that old. It seems like something would be a little bit more modern than that. But the idea is that, that say, you're only six degrees of separation between uh, yourself and anybody in the United States, for example, although the original proposal was anybody in the world. And kind of the way this works is I have only one degree of separation from Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, I knew Lee Harvey Oswald's, Oswald's brother, who was a member of the Edgemere Church of Christ when I was a youth minister there back in the 70s. Uh, I'm only one degree of separation from George W. Bush. George W. Bush was a friend of Jack Wilkinson, who my dad worked for and managed his ranch for for 45 years. George W. Bush ate lunch in my parents' home uh, back when he was in the oil business in Midland. So I know that he's had at least one good chicken fried steak in his life. So we sit with Theophilus, which makes us really close to Luke and close to Jesus. So you have Theophilus, Luke, and then Jesus, or those eyewitnesses. So we're really close to the Lord. And as I said earlier, don't skip the introduction. Now we're going to read birth stories. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. 
But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now I want to say, first of all, this is a story we've heard before. Where have we heard this story? Well, you read the Old Testament. Maybe in Genesis it is. that You read a story about an elderly couple who are childless and had prayed for a child. So it has an interesting beginning. And there is, from the beginning, a short thread that I'm not going to tie up until we get to the next lesson, maybe the third lesson. Yeah, it would be the third lesson, actually. So I want you to remember, here's where we started. We started with an elderly couple who did not have children, though they had prayed for children. And notice also how, again, Luke is careful to give us his initial reader and readers some historical anchor in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Not a precise date, but what he's saying is when Herod was king, this was what was going on. And so we have an elderly couple of the tribe of Levi advanced in years who had suffered the disappointment of being childless, and yet they were faithfully following God. And so Zechariah, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And while he is there, an angel of the Lord will appear to him while he places incense on the altar. This is a model of the temple where Zechariah was serving in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. This model is outside the, uh, it's an outdoor model outside the, the Jerusalem uh, Museum. And so he's inside that, that large structure there. And there's going to be people in the courtyards around it. You have the, the courtyard where Jewish men could, get, could go, but not inside the temple. You had the courtyard of the women, which is toward the front of that whole structure. And then the outer uh, courtyard around all of that is going to be the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles would be. And so he is, he is standing before this altar of incense, this little model of what the altar of incense would have looked like. And Zechariah is offering incense before God while the people outside were praying, for they knew the time of the offering of the incense. And they were praying outside, and that whole the smoke of the incense going up would have been representative of the prayers of the people going up before God. And while he was there, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, no doubt, Zechariah had done this many times. And he had been inside the holy place many, many times. But never had he seen an angel of the Lord. Which, of course, means that he's troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. There is so much here, I can only say a, a bit about, about what we find here. First of all, do not be afraid. If you think you've seen an angel, didn't hear the words, do not be afraid, then pretty likely from a New Testament point of view, you didn't see an angel, you're seeing something else. Because every time an angel appears, in the New Testament, almost every time, not quite, but almost every time an angel appears, the first thing he's going to have to say is do not be afraid. We'll notice that here in the first chapter particularly. Secondly, your prayer has been heard. The Lord said yes, and I've come here to tell you that. And here is what is going to happen. 
And certainly you cannot read this part of the chapter without appreciating the joy and the gladness that is to come. Then the other thing that I want to focus on is he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the things that we have in the Gospel of Luke into the book of Acts is the attention given to the presence of the Holy Spirit in all that happens. Uh, Here at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we see very much uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit working God's will on earth. And then when we start Acts, the very same kind of thing will happen. And so if you want to learn about the Holy Spirit, probably uh, beginning in the New Testament, the first place to go is this chapter. And then read all through Luke's writings to gain some things of understanding about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in our world. The description that is given of this baby boy to be born is how devoted he will be to God. Uh, He is going to be uh, sort of the Nazarite vow. He will not uh, participate in strong drink, which will be a sign of his dedication. And he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. That means then he will go forth in the Spirit and the power of Elijah. That is going to be another fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that comes in this gospel and he will turn the heart turn the turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared those words in red Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Would recall Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. In other words, um, um, Zechariah should have thought about Malachi. My hunch is in the immediate moment, he didn't. But later on, he would have remembered what Malachi said and realized what, what a significant thing is beginning to happen here through his life and Elizabeth's life, their life as a a married couple. I also think we ought to notice the fact that uh, Luke uses the word for turn, a word for turn twice. Uh, It means to cause a person to change belief with focus upon that to which the person turns. Interestingly, half of the uses of this word in the New Testament are in Luke's writing. And so perhaps he wrote that he would turn Theophilus in the right direction. That's what's going on here. He wants Theophilus to be certain. And he's working to turn him in the right direction. And I think the the other thing that strikes me about this little uh, paragraph here is that what John was conceived and called to do still needs to be done to turn the hearts of fathers to their children. Doesn't that have a a very modern, a very present ring to it, given given our circumstances? And it's an answer to their prayers, the prayer of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And yet, notice, even though the angel says your prayer has been answered, notice how he reacts. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said, well, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words that will be fulfilled 
in their time. How shall I know this? Well, to me, it's a reasonable doubt. He knew how it happened, and he was old and well advanced in years. And so, how is it going to happen? Yet, the messenger from the Lord has already said, here's what's going to happen. And so, essentially, uh, what he says is just be quiet for a while and watch God work. And that might be a word to some of us. So, the birth stories continue. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. They were wondering at his leave when he came out. He was unable to speak to them, just like the angel said. And they realized he had seen a vision. And he kept making signs to them, and he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Lived somewhere in the region, or in the countryside around Jerusalem. Somewhere in Judea is where they lived. And then his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying... Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. We've heard this story before. And then the birth stories. The birth stories continue. Here is the birth story upon which we have a lot of focus right now. In the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, Her name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. One of the things that he is making clear to us is that she, what is about to happen is prior to Mary having sexual relations with any man. In Mary's time and culture, everyone who read that description, a virgin betrothed, would know that she had not uh, lived with Joseph or known Joseph in any way. That's, that's the point of what he's saying there. For betro- marriage in that culture started with betrothal, which was initiated by the groom's father, agreed to by the bride's father. Then there was a bride price given to the bride's family. And, but, it, but, but up to a year before the... the uh, wedding would actually take place. And so sometime after betrothal, but before wedding, in this period of time, that's when Gabriel came to her. And she was greatly troubled, just like Zechariah, greatly troubled. What kind of greeting is this? And the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son. And so the announcement about both of these boys is that great things are coming. Great things. Both John uh, the baptizer, uh, John son of Zechariah, and now Jesus to be born to Mary. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Again, you hear so much of the Old Testament being referred to and fulfilled here. You shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. He will be Son of the Most High. He will be given David's throne. That's uh, 1 Samuel 7. Uh, The Lord will give Him David's throne. He will reign forever and ever of His kingdom. There will be no end. Her reaction is, well, it's a bit like Zechariah's. How will this be? I'm a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child will be going, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And then he says, go talk to Elizabeth, and she can confirm these things. And so in a sense, the sign for Mary was go visit her relative Elizabeth, for she's in the sixth month. And uh, she who was barren is pregnant. You can go and see that. Nothing is impossible with God. And Mary's reaction is, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed departed from her. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. It actually means I'm a slave girl of the Lord. Her response was a response of complete obedience. And she humbled herself before God. And so what we'll be doing is looking at what begins to happen from that point on which occurred in Nazareth, what we just read about uh, uh, Mary occurred up in Nazareth. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived somewhere down in Judea, but here's Jesus' world. We'll follow the Lord 
to places like Tyre, Caesarea Philippi, uh, Bethsaida, all the way down to Jericho, Bethlehem. That will be the journey that we follow in the Gospel of Luke. And it all really begins very close to the Sea of Galilee. God keeps His promises to David from 2 Samuel 7. Uh, God keeps His promises, I said first a minute ago, and I thought that doesn't sound right. It's 2 Samuel 7. To Israel, God keeps His promises to all families of the earth. In a sense, this whole story goes back to Genesis chapter 12. Thank you very much for your presence today. Uh, I will say this. It's all about some very ordinary people, but a very extraordinary God. That is a word of hope for us. Lord willing, next Sunday, Luke 1, 39 through 56, is a good time to read the Gospel of Luke. The Lord, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.